looking at giving this morning. Bible in Proverbs 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. I read a few statistics about givers online. These are from research websites and, and people that research, Pew Research, Barna Research. They say this, that people who have salaries of less than $20,000 a year, people who, have less, who make less than twenty grand a year, are eight times more likely to give to the church than those who make over 75000 Someone who makes below poverty level, 20000 a year, according to the U.S. government, is eight times more likely to give than someone who makes 75000 or more a year. This number blew me away, or this, this statistic blew me away. They said Christians today give less per capita than during the Great Depression. They said, on average, people during the Great Depression per capita, or based on the averages, gave more then to God than they do today. I would think that we probably are a little wealthier today than we were in the Great Depression, but we're stingier. Those who attend smaller congregations are more likely to give than those who attend larger congregations. They say, if you're part of a small congregation, you feel it more. They said that those who tithe give 10%, typically only make up to 25% of any congregation. And since 1990, religious giving is down about 50%. So today, I want to talk about giving. You say, okay, pastor, I know. Here's your plea for money. Give it to me straight. All right, just give it to us. Tell me about giving, and then I'll feel the conviction. I get mad at you, and I'll leave out the back door. I've mentioned this a few times, but I want to mention this morning that I am not here talking about giving because I'm worried about the lights being out of First Baptist Church. There have been times in the history of First Baptist Church that finances have been extremely tight here. There have been times where we had to make sure that we put the deposit in so the checks would be covered that were written. Here, the Lord has blessed us this past year. If the offering doesn't get in tomorrow, all the checks we have written will cash just fine. We do not have a late notice from consumers. Oh, I'm not worried that the heat will be turned off this week or whatever will we do. But that's not why I'm talking about giving. I'm not talking about giving just because we may need something. In fact, if you turn on your te television, the average TV preacher will mention money every single sermon. Every single sermon. We have a TV ministry. I make it a point not to talk about money until you hear this message right here. Why is that? I want to talk about money this morning because the Bible talks about money. In fact, the Bible talks more about finances, more verses about finances and money than there are about heaven. I'm not saying money is more important than heaven. Heaven is where Jesus is at. But I am saying that what we do with our money is of the utmost importance to Jesus Christ. And here, Paul gives us some principles about money this morning that I want to briefly look at. The first thing I see this morning is the purpose of our giving. You see, giving to God is not just about the need for God. It's about obedience and honor toward God. The Bible tells in verse number 7, Paul says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. I think there are three things in our purpose of giving that we must understand. The first thing is this, that there is a priority in giving. The Bible says, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. My question this morning is, what is your first priority in your finances? For some people, it is to make sure that they have enough in their savings account. And I'm all for you having a savings account. We have some money set aside here at First Baptist Church in a savings account. But that is not the first priority we're called to. The first priority is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Others want to make sure, first priority, is to make sure that they're all set for retirement. 
And I hope that you're planning, or if you're there, that you're ready for retirement. But that is not the first priority in our life. The first priority is to seek first the kingdom of God. The, must, the purpose that we must have is a priority that says, God, you are first. Sometimes I'll be asked this question, well, pastor, am I supposed to tithe off my gross income or my net income? Do I tithe, do I give 10% to God before taxes or after taxes? It's a wrong question. The question that must be asked is, what's your first priority? Because that question sounds a whole lot like, I'm the first priority. What am I supposed to do? Where I ought to be asking, God, what would you have me to do? What, what should I give to you? How, how can I make you the primary purpose in my finances? You see, God's priority must be my priority in my money. In my bank account, whether you use United Financial, or whether you use Chase, Independent Bank, or PNC, whichever bank you use, God's priority, His bank, is the ultimate priority we must have. There's a purpose in giving. There's the praise in giving. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with thy substance. You know that when we give, we are showing praise to Him, thankfulness to Him. We are glorifying Him. We're saying, God, I want to give back to you. I want to honor you. I want you to, to, to reap some of what you've given to me. You know that everything is God's anyway? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything is God's in the first place. But boy, we get stingy, do we not? Look what I got in my paycheck. Look at the bonus that I got. Look at my overtime. And I get to praise God when I give. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. You see, I want to have a purpose in my heart of a priority toward God. I want God to be first in my money, but I want to praise God with my money. How do we do that? Well, I believe a large portion of it goes right here to the church. Now listen, that is not because I happen to be the pastor. It's the way the Bible set it up. Read 1 Corinthians in chapter 16 as they give through the church. All right, but also I can give uh, to others as well. Dr. Martin mentioned that. This passage mentions that. I get to praise the Lord. I get to honor him. There's also the perspective, though. In Sunday school, we looked at this passage, Luke chapter 12, where Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Covetousness, the act of wanting something I don't have. Well, we don't have that problem in America, do we? I can't imagine in 2021 that, that anyone would struggle with covetousness. There would not be a whole industry designed to promote covetousness, would there? Oh, but there is. It's called the marketing industry. The purpose of marketing is to help you, to make you, want something that you don't have yet. Beyond want, they want you to feel a deep-seated need for what they're promoting. There's lots of ways they do it. It's called brand recognition, brand awareness. They will spend billions of dollars. In fact, it was a big deal that some companies will not have a commercial in the Super Bowl tonight. It was a big deal not to have a commercial in the Super Bowl. Because they believe if they get that commercial in front of all those millions of people who watch football, that they will go out tomorrow and buy a brand new vehicle. You say, well, that's just crazy, Pastor Howell. If it's so crazy, then why do they spend billions every year and think it's profitable? Why does last time I checked, McDonald's spends over $1 billion, that's with a B, Dollars a year on advertising. And I would think McDonald's is fairly well advertised. Everyone knows McDonald's. It seems like children know it as soon as they're born. What are the first words? French fries. What's going on here? How do kids know that so early on in life? What do you want McDonald's? How do you want McDonald's? This is terrible. I'm thankful I'm almost past that stage in life. How have you done that, Pastor? By treating them with other foods. Early on, Daddy, can I have a happy meal? It may be happy for you, son, but it's not happy for Daddy. And they spend over a billion dollars so that when you're asked, what do you want? Oh, I got to have McDonald's. A whole industry designed to help you covet. You wonder why we mute commercials at the Howell House? 
One reason is for the music. The other reason is I don't need, and my kids and my family, we don't need any help wanting more things. Don't need any help with that. I already want enough things. And, and there's a perspective here in, in this purpose, perspective that we're supposed to hold, but not hoard it. All I have is from God Almighty. The life I live is not mine, but his. The material things that he's blessed me with are given to me for his service and to further his kingdom. I am to be a steward, a caretaker of all that God has given. In the Bible, we find that God gives different stewards, different caretaker, different things. Some he gives more to. Some he gives less to. In our current culture, even our current church culture, it seems that those who have less are critical of those who have more. Why did God bless them with more than I have? They're not that good of Christian. I saw them driving and they were going a mile an hour faster than the speed limit. I knew they didn't love the Lord. Why did they have something that I don't have what are they doing right that I'm doing wrong? You know what? It can't be that God would bless them differently. I didn't say better, just differently. It must be that where they get their blessing from is because they're focusing on earthly things. It's where our minds go. Oh, they're laying up their treasures on earth. Must be nice to lay up all your treasures here. Mine are in heaven. No, oh, you're a rotten complainer. As a caretaker, as a steward, God chooses to divvy differently he's allowed to he's the master and if he says listen this particular person i want to give a million dollars to and this particular person i'll give 55 cents to that's his choice and the responsibility is the same the perspective that i'm just a steward and so if i have a million i better use that to the glory of god if i have 55 cents i better use that to the glory of god those who have 55 cents wish they had the million. And often those who have the million wish they had the 55 cents because there comes responsibility. I'm just a steward. I can't hold it. I can hold it, but I can't hoard it. Or we'll say it this way. A man bought his son some French fries from McDonald's one day. And the father did what all fathers do. He reached down and took one French fry out of his son's small French fry. The little boy slapped his father's hand and said, Daddy, those are my French fries. Don't touch them. As the story goes, the father reacted like any decent father would do. Beginning with his mind, who does this boy think he is? He didn't make the French fries. He didn't buy the French fries. He didn't drive to the French fries. He can't even spell French fries. And now he's done with the French fries. I had blessed him with French fries, but he mistakenly thought they were just for his use. My friend, who do we think we are? The God of the universe blesses us with the very air that we breathe. And that is not where it stops. All of us have countless blessings like we talked about this morning after that song. We have countless blessings. I'm talking about financial blessings. Even the, the poorest among us in, in God's economy, in the world's economy, is rich beyond measure. And yet, and yet, we don't always use it for God's purpose. We have the wrong Perspective. Perspective. You see, not only is we're supposed to have the right purpose in our giving, but there's supposed to be, secondly, pleasure in our giving. That's what the verse says, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Dr. Martin mentioned in the testimony, he was very honest, that there are sometimes he gave grudgingly. Anyone who has given, I think if they were honest, would have to admit that there was probably at least one time that we grudgingly gave. At least most of us, would. I've been there before. When I know it's what I'm supposed to do, and I put it in the plate, but I didn't really feel good at that moment. Now, notice that the Bible does not say you only give if you're cheerful. It doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say only give if you're happy. It just says God loves. God is delighted in a cheerful giver. 
We're supposed to give either way. Either way. But God loves when we have pleasure in our giving. You know what? I have three children. I have pleasure when they obey cheerfully. I love a cheerful obeyer. Johnny, would you go clean your room? Yes, sir. I'd be glad to. I was hoping you'd ask me to. In fact, I was just thinking to myself, self, you're pretty bored right now. I hope your dad asked me to do something like clean my room. And dad, there you asked me. I'm happy. I'm on my way. Yes, sir. Boy, that'd make my heart glad. Would it not make yours, parents? Look at that. Whose son is that? That's my son, you know? Oh, man. That's not always the case at our house, though. Sometimes I say, hey, go clean your room. And, and it's a struggle as they walk up the stairs. And I don't let them talk ba back, parents. They're not allowed to talk back about that. I said, I don't let them talk back about it. But really, there's one sense of me, I don't care if they're happy or sad. If I ask them to clean their room, go clean your room. But I sure love a cheerful obeyer. I find pleasure in that. The Bible said God loves a cheerful giver. Does that make sense to you? The offering plate comes. Are you kidding? It's offering time already. Man, it couldn't get here fast enough. I was just sitting in the pew thinking, self, you have too much money. I hope they take an offering today. And look at that, pastor. You gave us an offering. Praise God. Lord, you sure blessed me. I can't wait to give. God loves a cheerful giver. I think two words help us describe a chill forgiver. Eager, eager. Boy, I can't wait. Eager to part with it. This is not mine, it's his anyway. I get to invest in his kingdom. Eager to part with it and to have a part with his work and enthusiastic. Wow, look what God did with how little I gave. Really, what you give today will not change much here but God can use it. I find in the Bible a little story about five loaves and two fishes. Remember that story? Jesus got a hold of it and he fed 5,000 men plus others. Five loaves and two fishes. I wonder what that boy told his grandchildren. Son, let me tell you about the best. I know, Grandpa. You gave Jesus five loaves and two fishes. But son, you missed it. This is what he did with it. When that boy saw what Jesus did with five loaves and two fishes, what if Jesus the next day had said, Son, I need another five loaves and two fishes. Oh, you're taking all my loaves and fishes, Jesus. I got none left for me. See, that's what his response was. You think if Jesus had asked the next day if he would have said, No way? I don't think so. I think he would have said, Listen, Lord, if I give you ten loaves and four fish, you feed the world. God takes a little bit and does a lot with it. Think about what God did with the widow lady. A little bit, a little barley, a little oil, and did a whole lot with it. You see, I can think of no better way, no better investment than to put my finances, my money, in the master's hands and let him work with it. He's never made a wrong investment. He's never lost money. And when you invest with Jesus Christ, when you invest with God, you'll never, ever make a wrong investment. I can get enthusiastic about that. There's a mother who gave her daughter a quarter and a dollar for church. She said to her daughter, I want you to put one of those in the offering plate. After church, the mother sat down with the daughter and said, honey, which one did you put in? She goes, I put the quarter in. She said, well, why is that, dear? A little perplexed and wondering maybe she'd missed the idea of the lesson. The daughter said, well, mom, on the way to church, I had planned on giving God the dollar. But then during Sunday school, they said that God loves a cheerful giver, and I'd be a lot happier if I only put the quarter in, so I did that. I think maybe she missed the point. God loves a cheerful giver. You see, there's a purpose in our giving, there's pleasure in our giving, and last this morning, there is power for our giving. You see, when someone doesn't give, there's usually a pretty big ro roadblock in the way. Sometimes that roadblock is called a bill. Pastor, I just don't see how I could give. I don't know, see why God needs that. He owns everything anyway, and I can't afford to give. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that, 
I can't afford to give. Sometimes it's bills. Sometimes it's fear. If I give, I'm not going to make ends meet. They'll turn off the heat to my house. My kids will starve. They'll take my vehicle. I'll be homeless. It'll be cold out. I'll freeze to death. So if I give, I'm basically dead. The roadblocks. But the Bible talks about that in verse number eight. The Bible says, Paul says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You see, for our giving, we will need some strength. Strength that God will give us in his grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, just two or three chapters later, Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. If you feel like you can't give today, my friend, I ask you to trust the grace of Jesus Christ. He'll give you the strength to give. You may not understand it, but the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. He has a way of making it all work out. If you were to ask anyone who is a faithful giver, they will tell you the same story with different details that I gave and God provided my needs. I know of no one who's a faithful giver to God who has ever told me a story, God has let me down. In fact, I've heard the opposite over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And somehow you think if you give, you'll be different? No, God will still provide for you. Not only is there strength, there's security. That's what this verse says. Look, if you would please, in verse number eight. So we finish this morning. Where Paul says, and God is able to make all, see that? All grace abound towards you. That she always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. You know what God can do? All things. He gives you the strength, but he gives you the security, sufficiency in all things. He won't let us fail. Or I'll say it this way, it will be just fine. In fact, if you were to embark on this journey of giving to God, I guarantee, because I know the way God works, that you will have testimonies just like you've heard throughout Stewardship Month at First Baptist Church. You will see God work. You'll be able to say, you know what? I don't know how this worked out, but God did this. You know what? I was a little bit begrudging God on this one, and, but I still put it, I still obeyed God. But boy, God did this over here. God has a way of blessing. Yesterday, sitting there in the truck with my boys, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Thy wine presses shall burst forth with new wine. I said, boys, the Bible says that if we honor God, if we give And praise God that that, that God will make the barns be filled with plenty. I said, Johnny and James are in the truck with me. I said, I want you to think about something. We have a barn. Not everyone has a barn. I said, we have a barn. I said, boys, what's in the barn? They begin to list off the blessings of God, the plentiness of God. That verse, it's a reality. You say, oh, pastor, I don't have a barn. It's still a reality. Someone said there are three types of givers. Flint, sponge, and the honeycomb. The flint, you have to hit it with a hammer to get anything off it. The sponge, you have to squeeze it. And the more you squeeze, the more comes out. But the honeycomb just overflows with sweetness. You see, our giving reflects our heart. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I wonder this morning if your heart is in a place of giving toward God. I don't look at the giving records here at First Baptist Church. I could and maybe I would at some point. So I don't speak this morning out of looking around saying, oh, well, I know they're a giver. (laughs) Oh, they're not a giver. I don't know that. But God does. God knows exactly where your heart is at. He knows even if you put something in the plate, if you're truly giving with the right purpose. He knows if you have pleasure in your giving. And he knows what kind of giver you are. My challenge this morning, be a giver. 
But don't just be a grudging giver. Be an eager, enthusiastic giver. And I promise, based on the authority of God's word, that God will take care of you. He may divvy differently. To some, he divvies this. To some, he divvies this. But he will never fail you. God cannot fail. What kind of giver are you this morning? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have blessed us beyond measure. Lord, even on our darkest days, you are still good God. Lord, I ask you to help us to be honest this morning in our heart in regards to our money. Lord, help us to be true to you. Lord, we can fool all those around us, but we can never fool you. I wonder this morning, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you'd say, Pastor, as you spoke this morning, God spoke to me. Perhaps you've not had the priority to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Perhaps you've been seeking your own gain. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Because I need his priority to be my priority. I would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning? I'll raise my hand and ask you that you would pray for me. You should pray for others. Amen. I see that. Who else? I need your priority to be my priority. Who else? Who else? wonder who would say this, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me, and, and I want to be in a place where I am eager to give to God. Right now, maybe you're still being faithful, but God's not in love with your giving. You're still obeying Him, but it's not pleasure. Who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? It's hard right now, but I see that, and I want to please God in this way. I want to have pleasure as I give to Him. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Would you just slip your hand up, slip back down? I'll see that. Amen. Amen. Who else? Lord, touch my heart this morning. Amen. Who else? Who else? And who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm really struggling with this thing giving, and I need the power of God in my life. I really need his power. I don't know how I'd make it work. It doesn't make sense on paper to me. I look at the budget, and it, but I think God wants me to change something in my life. Would you pray for me that I have his power? Because I'm going to need it. I didn't raise my hand before I raise it. Now who would say, Pastor, would you, when you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I need this power in my giving. Amen. I see that. Who else? Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. Maybe you're here this morning. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. One of you say, Pastor, as you spoke, something was happening in my heart. I'm not sure that I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me as well? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you, my friend, this morning. He would say, you know what, Pastor? I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to be sure. I'd like to know when you pray for the others, would you pray for me? And I'm slip my hand up and acknowledge that. I'll see that hand. Lord, thank you for this time, for your word. Lord, you've seen the hands. Of me. Lord, you know the hearts. Lord, you know the decisions that need and ought to be made today. Lord, may we respond to you in obedience and humility. In Jesus' name, amen.